This is NTV. Good evening to you. Thanks for joining us on NTV tonight. I'm Smriti Vidyarthi, and these are our top stories. Tonight, the suspects are directed to them. More denials. DP Ruto explains where in his office Echessa spent 23 minutes as KDF denies involvement. <laughs> Former CS released on bail. Plus, cost of polluting Lake Victoria. It was of our interest to come uh, at this point to see where the water is exiting. NTV investigates the extent of damage on toxic flow. And pest infestation continues to bite. Government denies hiring foreign experts to combat locust invasion. Also tonight, this is a person of intense interest as an officer of government making this kind of commitment without even the knowledge of the accounting officer. Health CS grilled over cancellation of multi billion shilling tech deal. NTV Tonight with Smriti Vidyarthi. Thanks for joining us. Flora Atieno is our sign language interpreter. The office of the deputy president has been forced to issue a formal statement regarding former sports cabinet secretary Rashid Echessa. He and three others denied criminal charges related to fraud, but they will spend a fifth night in custody as a one million shilling cash bail or a three million shilling surety imposed on the accused is sought. NTV's senior reporter Kennedy Moredi has those details. Former Cabinet Secretary Rashid Echessa and three others will have to spend another night in remand as government bureaucracy involved in releasing accused persons went past 5 o'clock Monday evening. The four men Echessa, Daniel Otieno alias General Juma Onyango, Clifford Okoth and Kennedy Oyo faced 12 counts including conspiracy to commit a felony and making documents without authority. But before they could take plea, there was a push and pull over an unsigned affidavit presented before court by the Director of Public Prosecutions opposing any bail terms. The defense had four lawyers determined to win freedom for a chesser and his co-accused. The signature of the deponent is a photocopy. The law never contemplated such a scenario of life. It contemplated that a commission of David must be original. For the prosecution to come and say that they are going to interfere with witnesses, they must show how they come to that conclusion. Not guessing, not assuming. How you come to that conclusion? And that must be by facts. Magistrate Kennedy Cheriot took issue with the prosecution, led by Jacinta Nyamosi from the Office of the Director of Public Prosecution, for hurriedly presenting the case in court without tying all those ends. The investigating officer states... We do not want to discuss. I just wanted to know generally what it is all about. Can you explain then why didn't you put it in, this affidavit? Because I know inspector of police should know that an affidavit is supposed to be commissioned. If not by a magistrate, by a commissioner for oaths. And there are very many here. Could there be others? The defense capitalized on the blunders that worked against the prosecution's desire to keep the men in custody. Each 
of the accused to execute a bond of 3 million shillings and avail one surety of a similar amount, or alternatively, each through di is directed to deposit cash bill in the sum of 1 million shillings. But even as the four battled their freedom in court, detectives spent the better part of the day tracing their last steps before their arrest on Thursday last week. They once more visited the office of the deputy president at Harambe Annex to comb through documents as they sought more evidence. According to multiple sources, there are crucial pieces of evidence being pieced together by detectives that may lead to more revelations in this unfolding case. Today, the deputy president's office was forced to write a comprehensive statement on what they know about the case, thus abandoning the Twitter approach they used on Sunday. In the 12-point communique, the communication secretary, David Mogonyi, distances officers in the DEP's office from any contact with either Echesa or his co-accused, saying none of his close aides were in the office on 13th February when Echesa was arrested. He notes Chief of Staff Ken Osinde, Private Secretary Ruben Mayo, and Personal Assistant Farouk Kibet were not in Harambe House Annex on the material day as alleged by the media. Thus, the deputy president considers this a very serious matter involving a government office and being an issue that has recurred in many such offices once investigations expedited devoid of political and media propaganda. The Ministry of Defense has also vehemently distanced itself from the scam saying, today, investigators and complainants in the matter visited Ulinzi House, that is the Ministry of Defense headquarters, to ascertain the offices and officers they allegedly accessed. The statement further says, during the visit, it was established that the complainants have never interacted with any official mandated to represent the Ministry of Defense. An application by HS's lawyers to have a vehicle and two firearms belonging to him released was vehemently denied as the prosecution insisted that they were very crucial pieces of evidence in the ongoing case. The pre-trial has also been set for the 3rd of March. Kennedy Moreidi, NTV in Nairobi County. From one controversy to another and to the controversy around the Managed Equipment Service Project at the Ministry of Health, well, it's now taken a new turn. Outgoing Cabinet Secretary of Health, Cicely Kariuki, says the coordinator of the program, Morenga Murekwa, and other ministry of officers, including the procurement officers, are to blame for the scandal. She accused them of authorizing documents contrary to legal requirement. Cicely appeared today before the Senate Ad Hoc Committee in the ongoing inquiry into the billion shilling scandal in the health ministry. Eunice Omolo with more. Health CS Cicely Karaoke once again appeared before the Special Senate Committee to answer questions about managed equipment service project that costs counties about 200 million Kenya shillings annually. In her submission, Karaoke claimed that officials within the ministry could have colluded with the Seven Seas technology to alter the 4.9 billion Kenya shillings contract tender documents for the health information system projects. Chair, I, I, this, these documents had not been, come, uh, been brought to my attention. Um, Murekwa Kari is a title of the chairman of MES. In legal, that does not exist anywhere. He's on record on also being with a contractor in some place with documents as soon as I tabled them here to you is a person of intense interest. As an officer of government making this kind of commitment without either the knowledge of the accounting officer or my office. This, she says, is the reason that led to the cancellation of the Healthcare Information Technology, HCIT, that will have helped to link hospitals and other managed equipment services across the country. I don't know why did the ministry allow him to be signing these documents as chair of mess over the years minister and committing the government. And instead of actually taking action against him, he's being transferred to yeah. his parent ministry. According to Karaoke, the award of the tender to Seven Seas Technologies was signed by the head of procurement in Ministry of Health for and on behalf of the principal secretary, while the acceptance of the award by the contractor was addressed to the head of procurement contrary to the law. It should be understood, Chairperson, and I want this on record, that the likelihood of tampering with information has been one of the hallmarks around these very projects. 
even some of the letters that I'm seeing here signed by Murekwa that you have just availed to me had actually been brought to me as a CS to sign. But I quickly read it and I said, this is not my work and somebody wants me to move in a certain direction. The Senate committee also accused the ministry of not being truthful with the office of the attorney general in making a legal determination of the contract. One, we've shown you a document that shows that in the bid documents, the issues that the Attorney General is saying were not there are there. The biggest concern raised by the ad hoc committee following the cancellation of the contract is the likelihood of the country losing about 3.7 billion Kenya shillings in fines if the contractor can prove that the government through the Ministry of Health breached the agreement. Eunice Omolo, NTV, Nairobi. Elsewhere now, last night we aired a special report on the failing health of Lake Victoria, detailing how human-caused pollution is poisoning the lake's water, threatening its life and the lives of those who depend on it. Now, this report is an urgent examination of the crisis facing East Africa's biggest resource and a rallying call to the country to protect it. In our final part of our special feature, Toxic Flow, we look at the massive cost of the region's plunder of Lake Victoria and how the plague is carried on through the only river that flows from it, the River Nile. Here is Sheila Sendeo. The end of the Sea River's great journey, where its waters touch the frigid northern shores of the Lake Victoria. It's a place of almost unimaginable emptiness, wild, almost ungovernable. The withering jungle glistens, impenetrable it seems, but only interrupted by the stream of water coursing past. Seoport on the Kenya-Uganda border was once a thriving fishing village, rich with heritage, but fish catches plummeted the entire industry collapsed. Now it sits forlorn, a rough and tumble town on the edge of the map. Its inhabitants, like Ismail Muslim, are now riding a new wave and filling their boats with a whole new catch. Sand a humble grain that has become an astonishingly hot and precious commodity. And River Seal brings tons of it at the place where it meets the lake. Omar Musa Ibrahim says pollution upstream sullied the lake and took away his livelihood. Now he too takes away from the lake as his cars for these tiny, sparkling yet seemingly insignificant particles. With just basic equipment such as shovels, they hark at the shores, the last foothold against the advancing lake. Sand mining muddies the water, killing the fish, plants and other organisms that live there. Now the government also plans to start digging, but on a larger scale, 
to build on an unfinished dream by the country's first president, a bridge to connect Kenya and Uganda. But the lives of these border communities have always been intertwined. Sisi, tuko na wajirani, Uganda. Lakini wenzetu wa Uganda, ndiyo samaki zinato zinazaliwa huku Kenya. Alafu zizikuwa kubwa zinaondoka zinaenda uga. Lakini wenzetu, aotaki sisi tuingie Uganda. Tulienda siku moja pale Uganda. Watu ambia nyinyi mnavua uvui mbaya. Sababu mnaua samaki ndo? Ndogo. Ripples of dispute have often marked the relationship between the two neighbors bound together by this vast resource. Following the creeping death of Kenya's fish industry, fishermen routinely venture into Uganda. The lucky ones return with a decent catch. The unfortunate ones encounter Uganda's military. They are incarcerated for days, weeks or months and their fishing gear and boats confiscated. Uganda has been experiencing a frenetic growth in its fish stocks. At the Masese fish landing site in Jinja, it's a palmy time for fish traders. Business is flourishing. In 2017, we had a problem of getting a small fish, the size, small size. But now, as you see, big size, it is increasing. Every year, I think we shall be getting big, big, big fish. Eh? When fish are small, to make one kilo, you put three, because it is small. But now, there you get one fish, which, which is big, is making four kilos, five kilos. That one is the difference. But it's a story of a boom and bust. Ginger has endured decades of near economic ruin. The fishing industry was on a free fall, and it's been a long climb back to the top. Everybody thought that uh, this water cannot be affected. So whoever who had any rubbish, anything, could bring and dump in water. Most of so the investors, as you see from the other end to the other end, we have industries. These industries had done more harm than good because all their waste could just put it in the, in the water, let in the water. People had, had started even starving because the main source of food here is fish. So when we had no food, people had to think a lot. This success story was in part written by the Uganda's military's brutal hand. Deployed in 2017, the Uganda People Defense Forces, known for their ruthlessness, cracked down hard on illegal fishing and pollution that were blamed for the plummeting fish stocks. Confiscating the nets with smaller mesh, including mosquito nets that have been used to haul in even underage fish, spawning a new epidemic of overfishing. For those who still think that this operation will go and you want to hide your nets and your boats, we shall be here not today only, but until 2050. But the military's intervention, though savagely violent, kept the district's maritime traditions and the fishing industry afloat. But the country has for long been in the front line in the battle to keep the lake and its underground community alive. Despite the cleanup campaign, though, our tests on the fish samples we took from Masese Fish Landing site showed that they were heavily contaminated with lead and pesticides.
Further away from the military's might and in the capital, Kampala, a stream of slime empties into the lake undeterred. The Nakivu Bo Channel cuts through the densely populated capital, a city of more than 1.6 million people. It carries into the Lake Victoria the city's rubbish and effluent that is laced with a concussion of heavy metals, including lead, copper, chromium, zinc, iron and fluoride that are detrimental to the lake's aquatic life. Tanzania's Gulf areas, such as this Peak Gulf that is also home to Tanzania's second largest city, Mwanza, are heavily polluted. Thousands of tons of sewage and industrial waste drain into the lake daily. Agricultural runoff from the intensively farmed lake shores saturates the lake with nutrients, allowing the cancerous growth of green algae that sucks the oxygen from the water as it decays. Part of the lake can no longer support any life. But the dying lake is also a symbol of life for communities far beyond its shores. From the lake, a 7,000-kilometer lifeline for nearly 400 million people starts an epic adventure through rapids and swamps, snaking through some of the continent's wildest sections. To Egypt, a country bound by desert and where this river is the only source of water. The Nile is Egypt's wellspring of civilization, sustaining their agricultural and drinking water needs, a source of sustenance but also of tension. Egypt has for years sought to be the master of the Nile, seeking to tame the river's flow and exert exclusive control over its use. But upstream countries such as Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania that share the Lake Victoria have been challenging this dominance and pushing for greater say on the use of the lake and the Nile waters. But the Nile is a river of mystery and secrets, and some of those are best kept beneath the crystal clear waters. Upstream, if you look at the dynamics of the lake, you realize that there is a little bit of uh, some contamination that one can see. It was of our interest to come uh, at this point to see where the water is exiting and understand if what we are picking up there would also be uh, seen at this point. Our tests found that the Nile waters were contaminated with heavy metals such as lead, copper, zinc and fluoride at levels way above the safety threshold. The water is also corrupted by bacteria and a number of pesticides. This contamination now follows every of the river's twists and turns, every ripple a reminder of the reckless plunder of the lake. Water is a solvent. So if it has dissolved those chemicals, whatever goes out also has a contaminant, and especially at the source. They may decrease as the river flows because uh, rivers are a way of cleaning itself. By the time it goes all the way into Egypt, we don't know what could have happened. But you cannot rule out that there, won't. there are some chemicals which will not be cleaned, they will be there. This is the birthplace of the White Nile, an important tributary of the mighty River Nile, the longest river in the world. It flows from the Lake Victoria onwards to the Mediterranean Sea, providing life and nourishment to communities along its course. And while the real source of the Nile is still a contested affair among scientists at least, what's undisputed is the importance of the Lake Victoria as a transboundary resource.
Lake Victoria runs East Africa. For instance, here in Jinja or here in Masese, we have done our best. But do we know what is happening to a person in Kisumu, to a person at Mwanza, to a person in Soma, Bukoba? So it needs a joint effort. One good thing with the natural resources is that they have a way of regenerating and water is able to regenerate. However, when we, eat, we have a lot of human uh, interference, then we are not able to, to, to have uh, the full cycle. But it is our responsibility to take care of our waters. It's hard to talk about the death of a lake when it's patently still there, thousands of miles of gleaming waters. But life, measured in the quality of its bounty, the fish, its natural beauty and splendor is slipping away and many seem to have resigned to the lake's demise. Around the region, the fishermen who rely on Lake Victoria's once abundant fish population for their livelihood know they are living on borrowed time. Kwanza tumekosa maji, atutumii maji, atukunyu maji, sahi. Kama hii maji mbake wa nyama. Sii tulikuwa tunakunyu tula hera. Sahi ya tuwewezikani. Na kwanza hii maji, hiko na chemical. Unaona. Ukienda kusimama kwa hii maji kwa dakika 45 utaona kama kama mguu yako inaanza kukatia kitaka kidogo kidogo unaona hata samaki ambayo ikipatikana hapo kilala tu uh, uh, one half day utaona utakuta kwamba hiyo samaki inaosa kwa haraka sana kitambo samaki yanze kupunguka hata mimi ninaenda hapo lakini sasa ni niko time tu niende nipate kidogo tu kama ninaangalia nje kama unaona kama sasa hii mimi ndio the water in the lake is not safe. The fish is also not safe in most areas. But uh, that can be improved through control of pollution. It may be not be very accurate, but I would place it maybe at four. But what can happen? The problem is, are we able to move it from now four towards one, or is it going to deteriorate from four towards seven? You see, that four could be an average, but there are some areas which you could say maybe they are at nine. If he's right, then the Lake Victoria may be as good as dead. There for all to see, for boats to sail on, but dead except for the algae, the bacteria, the worms, and all the underwater undesirables. A truly heavenly life turned into a living hell for a generation with few viable prospects. Sheila Sendeo, NTV. Toxic flow there by Sheila Sendeo and team. What a devastating reality. And let's hope that somebody is listening and that something can be done. Just some feedback from you online using the hashtag Toxic Flow. Baba Gaya, you say, can somebody please remind me of the responsibilities of NEMA? How do they allow such effluent to get into the lake? And then we have Ambrose who says, a case of cruel capitalism in Kenya. Wow. Also on Twitter, uh, Greenlay Consultants, you say, sadly, the government machineries have started erupting, ready to stop the toxic flow in Lake Victoria. When Nairobi River was aired, they rose up guns blazing. Once the cameras went off, they went back to their big office. The same will replicate. Sad. James Gendy, you say, what's happening? 
the Lake Victoria is dying as we watch. And that's just some uh, feedback from you uh, regarding toxic flow. We aired part one and two last night. This was part three. And if you did miss it, you can, of course, catch it online. At this point, we take a breather. There's more coming up. Stay with us. Taking pride in constructing tomorrow's skylines. Adding strength to Kenya's landmarks. Presenting the power for specialized constructions. Cementing the nation's future. Simba Cement, the strength and pride of Kenya. Now also produced in Nakuru and Mombasa. It feel good, Coca-Cola and food Monday to Sunday. We are chasing test. Let's just grab a bite, the excuse to drink Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. Every single day. So we feel forever be real. Together stay free whatever. No, we can't stop. We wanna test our feeling. Nothing can ever Birthday party! Birthday party! Mm. <laughs> birthday party! Mm. Birthday party! Birthday <laughs> party! Are we not invited? We have gifts! Valeria! <laughs> Mommy! Best! Run or die! <laughs> party! Compared to Nordmi Spray, Mortine Doom Power Guard kills disease causing pests instantly. Mortine Doom Power Guard. New Blue Band Peanut Butter. Made with 100% pure peanuts and a good source of omega-6. Grow healthy and happy kids with new Blue Band peanut butter. Your multi bet is only trying to hit the bullseye. Oh, you lose one match, but only in Mozart. Mozart refund, lose one game, get your cash back. Make a decision. Terms and conditions apply. Heaviness in a burning inside. It could be heartburn. Indigestion and heartburn? Eno gets to work in six seconds and works on the six symptoms of heartburn so you can keep living life non-stop. Eno, fight heartburn and indigestion fast. 143 Brookview presents to you the biggest deal. Buy a fully serviced 8th acre plot at 6.85 million shillings and build your dream villa. 143 Brookview in Membley is a luxury gated community on 20 acres with serviced plots and ready house designs for selection and construction at cost. It's easily accessible through the Northern Bypass and is in close proximity to schools, hospitals and malls. Social amenities to include a nursery school, retail center, riverfront recreational park and a clubhouse. So book today with only 10% and get amazing fittings for your dream villa. We welcome you to our open day on 22nd and 23rd February. SMS 143 to 20409 or call 0784 143 143. Financing available from Stanbic Bank. 143 Brookview. A development by eBoss Investments Company Limited. If your mind say pneumo microscopic silica volcanoconiosis. What on earth is that? Hey Enjo, thank you for assisting me with your rubber and sharpener. I love you. Hey, Kairo. Yadi Kairo, kona mudo na mimi sina. Are you going to help me or what? Uja mana ka familia. Nikanche mo na uku. Do you want a place to feed your mind, body, and soul? A secure place for your family? A center for quality academic goals for your kids? Call us today on 0790-300-300.
Welcome back. The Ministry of Agriculture has denied that it hired foreign experts to help assess the damage caused by desert locusts that have ravaged parts of the country for, th for the last three months, I should say. Speaking in Lysamis in Marsabit County, where he was assessing the damage left behind by the pests, Cabinet Secretary Peter Munya said the government was still committed to fighting the invasion and there are enough resources locally. The CS says affected counties should monitor the locusts' movements and report back. The government will, however, not yet declare the locust invasion a national disaster, saying the invasion is yet to hit crisis levels. I think, I don't know who brought the idea that we have brought in foreigners in this country. We have the expertise we need. Even the FAO people is a local office. Well, we've had unwanted visitors in Kenya over the last three months and they flew in without a visa, settled down without permission and began to consume our food uninvited. Now, of course, I am talking about those locusts. And tonight, Anita Nkonge takes a very close look at these insects to find out how they got here and what's been done to get them out. The last time Kenya experienced such a locust invasion was 70 years ago. According to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, the current problem initially began in 2018. A series of cyclones in May and October brought heavy rains that created the ideal breeding conditions for the pests all the way in the empty quarter of the southern Arabian Peninsula. Now, does the locust live for three months? After a generation matures, they lay their eggs, which, under the right conditions, can birth a new generation up to 20 times larger than the previous one. The series of cyclones therefore enabled three generations of locusts to be bred in nine months, June 2018 to March 2019. The swarms then crossed the Red Sea into Ethiopia and Somalia where they bred once again. Now, had Kenya not experienced the widespread rainfall last, late last year, perhaps we'd be telling a different story, but it did. And by late December last year, the first swarm of locusts arrived in Kenya. Since then, 17 counties have been affected by the swarms. These include Mandera, Wajir, Marsabit, Garissa, Isiolo, Meru, Samburu, Laikipia, Machakos, Baringo, Kitui, Embu, Muranga, Migori, Tukana, Tarakanidhi, and West Pokot. Hardest hit counties include Isiolo, Garissa, Turkana, Marsabit, and Wajir. According to the FAO, one swarm was found in Kenya covered an area of 40 kilometers by 60 kilometers. It literally is three times as large as the landmass of Nairobi County. It also means that such a swarm could contain up to 200 billion locusts. A locust can eat about twice its own f weight in food every day, which is about two grams. Therefore, when it comes to landmass, 75% of the country has been affected by the pests. And the locust is not yet done. <laughs> Many farmers across the counties have been expressing their worries that their crops are being destroyed and livestock left with nothing to eat. With a 230 million Kenyan shilling budget set aside to tackle the pests, Kenya had initially sought to combat the swarms using aerial and ground spraying operations, specifically targeting the matured locusts that fly. But the authorities have since changed their tactics. Now, not only are they spraying the flying pests, but they're now also focusing on the ground where there are nymphs. Nymphs are baby locusts that do not have wings, but can still manage to destroy crops. 500 National Youth Service officers are also being trained at the Yatta NYS Center and will be deployed to affected areas to combat the menace by using pesticides and other measures. A new batch of pesticides has also been procured by Japan in a renewed effort to contain and eliminate the locusts. According to Cabinet Secretary for Agriculture Peter Munya, a special team including a consultant has been put together to carry out assessments of the damage done and see who may be compensated for their loss. FAO warned, however, that there is an unprecedented threat to food security and livelihoods in the region. Already, Somalia has declared the locusts' invasion a national disaster. All right, Anita and Kogate, they're breaking it down for us. Elsewhere now, leadership trouble still stalks Nairobi County after the court stopped the planned vetting of Governor Sonko's nominee for the position of Deputy Governor. The anti-corruption court today ruled in favor of a petitioner who challenged the appointment on grounds that it went against the court's directive barring the governor from accessing his office. Emily Adwan. 
the leadership vacuum at the Nairobi County government was to be amongst the first items on the agenda for the county assembly when it resumes its sittings tomorrow. But that will not happen as planned. The anti-corruption court has put this on hold after a city resident moved the courts to stop it. The petitioner argues that the courts had stopped Governor Sonko from discharging his duty as governor and that that nomination was one of those duties. The vetting of the nominee was just one of the issues that the Assembly was expected to tackle with urgency. To ascertain whether the nominee meets the requirements set by the Supreme Court and IEBC. The Assembly will now have to wait until the case is mentioned again on the 10th of March before it knows whether or not that position will be filled. But before that, the Assembly will have its work cut out as it resumes sittings. It is set to vet George Osewe, nominated to serve as Tread CEC, and Karen Nyamu, the nominee to the Agriculture Docket. The two were nominated to the post on the 31st of January this year. The House is also likely to discuss the impeachment of the embattled Governor Mike Sonko. By the time the House went on recess, the minority whip had hinted at plans to oust the Governor over the graft case he currently faces in court. And now, with the House set to resume, the MCA says he has secured support from over 80 MCAs in this quest. The Assembly will also look into debating and passing the supplementary budget as well as restructuring the composition of various House committees to ensure that there is balance in these committees and that the MCAs play their oversight role fairly. Brenda Wanga, NTV. Education Cabinet Secretary Professor George Magoha has warned vice chancellors against establishing satellite colleges which threaten to water down the quality of education. The CS says the law ought to be changed to accommodate university reforms. NTV's education reporter Sharon Baranga has more. Cabinet Secretary Professor George Magoha says the quality of some of the graduates being churned out of institutions of higher learning is wanting. He has advised vice chancellors to ensure they're not drawn into a competition for numbers, which threatens to compromise the quality of education. We stopped talking about numbers, but ensured that even if your elegant university produces just 10 PhDs in a year, then there are PhDs that can stand the water. Institutions of higher learning were also challenged to take up an active role in solving issues affecting communities they are part of. There are three universities around the lake. <laughs> and the lake is polluted, full stop. So you ask yourself, what the hell are the universities around the lake doing? Do you get the point? Could it have been better if there were just two universities or one, which is focused, so they synergize on so many other things. Satellite campuses and duplication of programs is another matter affecting the quality of education, as well as motivation of teachers. Motivate the teachers to be able to teach. Give them continuous professional development, because as they are teaching, they need to get feedback. Use assessments. Education Cabinet Secretary Professor George Magoha says there are three pillars guiding his mandate at the ministry. That is to ensure the success of the competency-based curriculum, 100% transition of all Form 1s to secondary schools, and university reforms which is dependent on whether the law will be changed to accommodate them. The ministry says transition of students from primary to secondary school now stands at 99.7%. Now that we are finished with the 100% transition, I'm going to move to the, country, to the companies that are making money. For example, I shall not let Safaricom go off the hook. We are going to follow them until they sponsor some of the poor children. And we are going to follow some other companies that we also feel must give back to the society. Magoha was speaking during a meeting on international conference on university reforms with a the theme, Improving Higher Education Performance. Sharon Baranga, NTV. Give, uh... And it is time to take a quick break now, but joining me in studio is Julian Zamboko. Good to have you with us, and you've got some good news for farmers. Absolutely, Spiritu. You're talking about the Coffee Cherry Revolving Fund. Remember, early in the year, $3 billion was allocated, so Treasury has disbursed $2.7 billion, and we'll be giving you details on how this will actually be allocated to farmers right after the break on the business news.
Your multi bet is only going to hit the bullseye. Oh, you lose one match, but only in Mozart. Mozart refund, lose one game, get your cash back. Make a decision. Terms and conditions apply. Sona moja imetengenezwa kwa njia speciali ili kupambana na maumivu kwa haraka. Sona moja ina aspirin kama kiungo. Sona moja kitulizo kamili. Maumivu ya kizidi pata ushauri wa daktari. Call for long at one shilling fifty cents to all networks. Dial star 544 hash to subscribe. Telcom, moving with you. Foundation from Maybelline, New York. Fits your unique tone and texture. Blurs pores. Stop shine. For your most natural matte. Fit me matte and coreless. Only from Maybelline, New York. Glad you could join us. This is the only name in business. Welcome. I am Julian Amboko. Treasury has already disbursed 2.7 billion shillings of the 3 billion shillings Cherry Advanced Levy Fund to the new Kenya Planters Cooperative Union. The new board says farmers should expect to start accessing funds from March 2020. Rather, Lillian Carey with the details. The new KPCU says it is only being held back from starting to disburse the funds to farmers by the hold-up in gazetement of the regulation, which it says it is expecting to be done in the next one or two weeks. The funds are set to act as working capital for farmers. Coffee Cherry Advance Fund becomes a first charge. It's something for people to remember because it will be the first deduction from your coffee proceeds the moment the, the coffee proceeds come through. And uh, th therefore, there will be no issue of uh, that there's a time the coffee, ch uh, the coffee cherry fund is not uh, sufficient to, I mean, your price is not sufficient to cover that. KPCU has defended the move to have farmers bear an administration cost of 3% of the advanced amount. That administration charge will be the money to run the fund, in, starting, for example, with the making sure you secure the systems to do that, you secure professionals, you ensure you you know all the the, the running of the of the fund. The amount to be given to farmers from the fund will be determined by the quantity of coffee that has been supplied, either for milling or for sale at the Nairobi Coffee Exchange. To me, the greatest cartel is the low productivity. The greatest cartel is the opacity that normally is in the, in the, in the business. And to me, the greatest cartel is our inability to beat our neighbors that we used to beat face down, that they are eating into our, into, our, into our export market. Historically, when farmers get such advances, they use the money to sort out some of their cash flow challenges, such as paying school fees. Now, KPCU says it particularly does not have a problem with this, but this cherry revolving fund is set to sort out their production issues. Now, KPCU says it will be sending out a team of monitoring officers who will be moving door to door to ensure that the money is used for the right reasons. Lillian Kiarie, NTV. 
And staying with the agriculture bit, the price of tomatoes continues to shoot through the roof as the scarcity of the commodity bites, leaving consumers parting with more money to meet their day-to-day -day catering needs. In Baringo County, the price of tomatoes has risen from 2,500 shillings per crate to 4,500, following the scarcity of tomatoes occasioned by the prolonged rains experienced. At Marigat Open Market, tomatoes are hard to come by, with the price ranging from 10 shillings to 20 shillings per tomato. Traders from as far as Nairobi and Eldoret are traveling to Baringo in search of cheaper commodities. Kwa saa hii nyanya ni 100 lakini wenye wanakuja kuchukua nyanya kupeleka Nairobi wanausa nyanya moja 20 bob. Ofi sisi wa mama ya soko bado tunausa nyanya mingi na ili kwa shamba tunausiwa kali. Mimi ninaweza sema ninaweza nunua hii nyanya. Lakini hebu fikiria mama ambako nyumbani Mama ambaye na keti kungojea mwenye simunga angushie kitu. A, changamoto ile tunapitia kwa nyanya, e, tunapata kwa beikali sana. Asa wakati uu wa, wa, wa msimu wa mfua. And elsewhere, stakeholders in the drones industry has asked Parliament to quickly approve the draft regulations on unmanned aerial vehicles in order to allow full commercialization of the technology in the country. The stakeholders say the Kenyan market is ready for commercial drone operations, but delays in approvals of the regulations have stalled the rollout of technology, which they say could have been pivotal in combating the ongoing locust invasion. The draft regulations before the National Assembly prohibit, among other things, operating a drone at over 400 feet above the ground level and within 50 meters of any person vehicle or structure which is not under the control of the person in charge of the drone except with the authorization of the Kenya Civil Aviation Authority. The locust invasion, uh, which is uh, proving to be very hard and difficult to fight using, using the traditional methods. Uh, it's also very expensive to deploy the traditional methods to fight the locust uh, uh, invasion in the country. And uh, so the usage of drones has, is, uh, is something which, if we had a legislation ready today, uh, we would have probably uh, dealt or managed this uh, current situation at a, a much earlier and uh, much more efficiently. Definitely, the drones would have done a better job sending people outside there and spending a lot of money. Uh, the drones would, uh, will just need a drone to take like 30 minutes to sort out that issue. So I'm thinking it's a way of uh, cost cutting in most of the companies and we are ready to train people and take them to um, higher heights for, for this technology. And and it's time to take a look at the capital markets in the financial report. And that's it from the business desk. I now hand you over back to Smriti for more stories. All right, Julian, thanks very much. Before we turn our attention to other stories of the day, time for a quick break. Stay with us, more to come. With me.
Lipa na Mpesa, you get more. And now you can win. Lipa na Mpesa. There are surprise gifts to eight customers every minute. Tractors with extras. Lipa na Mpesa. Plus six apartments to be given away. Make payments via M-Pesa Buy Goods or Pay Bill. Every 100 shillings spent on Lipana M-Pesa earns you an entry into the draw. Do more with Lipana M-Pesa. I help women find independence by training them in fish farming. Oh, it's tough on my back, joints and can cause headaches. Panadol Extra relieves multiple types of pain. Panadol Extra, now with new Optizop technology to fight multiple tough pains with three times more pain relieving medicine in the first 30 minutes when you need it most. Seeing them support themselves makes any pain worth it. If symptoms persist, seek medical advice. Do your gums hurt? Yeah. Does your toothpaste contain sage, eucalyptus, mer, chamomile? All that in one toothpaste? Yes, try Colgate Herbal. Colgate Herbal contains nature's best herbs and Colgate's fluoride technology to give you strong teeth and healthy gums. Ah, Colgate Herbal. Let's go. Colgate Herbal for strong teeth and healthy gums naturally. Prepare yourself for a new live bet experience. Top Minute Boosted Live Bet Odds. Mozart, make a decision. The Third Way Alliance Party has relaunched the Punguza Mzigo campaign, pushing for an amendment to the constitution to change aspects of it that the party insists are still burdensome to Kenyans. Party leader Ekuru Okot insists that the party will chart its own path towards pushing for constitutional changes and will not rally behind the Building Bridges initiative that's also seeking a constitutional review. Constitutional change must not bring division to a country. As a matter of fact, as the highest law in the land, it must unite a people. The moment a constitution making process brings disunity, then that's a bad product. It must be abandoned. We have we have therefore proposed to criminalize the violation of, the, of our constitution by all state and public officers. The time when a state and or a public officer will violate the constitution and walk scot-free through these amendments is coming to an end. All other proposals are aimed at enhancing equity in our society. And the National Hospital Insurance Fund Board of Management has refuted claims that it could face financial constraints in the near future. Speaking to the media at the fund's headquarters, the board vice chairman, Robert Duba, said that despite the challenges that the fund has faced, such as corruption and misappropriation of funds, the board is working on reforms meant to stabilize the fund. As you know, in 2018, a whole lot of 19 to 20 managers, top level, including the CEO, were bundled out of this office on account of serious corruption allegations. Those cases are in court and they are ongoing. And it's very unfortunate that what is being recycled and recycled every morning about this fund are cases of 2012, 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18 until the last, uh, until the group were handled out or bundled out of office. Focus to the sports news and Ida joins us. Good to have you, Ida. What have you got lined up for us tonight? Well, Smithy, uh, huge news basically with uh, Harambe Starlet's all time top scorer, Esse Akida, joining a Turkish giant Besiktas. So much more on that. And I remember I talked to her last year. She was in Israel and I told her a big move is coming. I'm wow. so sure <laughs> that you're going to get a breakthrough. She did. All that and more after the break.
Breastfeeding tips for new mothers. Anticipate your baby's desires. You can anticipate their needs by watching for a few telltale signs. Get comfortable while nursing. The constant squirming and moving on your part can disrupt your baby's breastfeeding. Kiss, kiss, diapers. Kiss, kids. No rashes. Kiss, kids. No rashes. Bye, bye, rashes. Bye, diapers. Choose kiss, kid. Building tips for general construction should be bought from reliable sources, should not get dry before the specific curing time given for best results, must be kept certified. Exactly 50 kilograms guaranteed in each bag. Adding strength to Kenya's landmarks, power for specialized constructions, cementing the nation's future. Simba Cement, the strength and pride of Kenya. Now also produced in Nakuru and Mombasa. Molfix's breathable surface, developed with airsoft technology, is very soft and provides the best Molfix skincare. I've found the best diaper for my baby's sensitive skin. All babies deserve a high quality diaper. You should also try Molfix. <laughs> You get more, and now you can win. There are surprise gifts to eight customers every minute. Tractors with extras. Plus six apartments to be given away. Make payments via M-Pesa buy goods or pay bill. Every 100 shillings spent on Lipana M-Pesa earns you an entry into the draw. Do more with Lipana M-Pesa. Prepare yourself for a new live bet experience. Top minute boosted live bet odds. Mozart, make a decision. If your mind say pneumo microscopic silica volcanoconiosis. What on earth is that? Hey, Angel, thank you for assisting me with your rubber and sharpener. I love you. Hey, Cairo. Yadi Cairo, kona mutu na mimi sina. Are you going to hire me or what? Uja mana ka familia. Nikanche muona uku. Do you want a place to feed your mind, body, and soul? A secure place for your family? A center for quality academic goals for your kids? Call us today on 0790-300-300. NTV Sport, in association with Mozart Bet. SMS NTV to 2990. A very good evening, and uh, just as we talked about right before the break, Harambe Starlet's all-time top scorer, Ese Akida, has completed a two-year move to Turkish giants Besiktas. Akida, who became the first Kenyan to score in the Africa Women's Cup of Nations in 2016, was previously at Israeli side FC Ramat Hasharon. The 27-year-old is poised to...
definitely a good sign of where women's football is headed. English Premier League club Everton will end their shirt sponsorship agreement with Kenyan betting firm Sport Pesa at the end of the 2019-20 season. Everton, who had signed a five-year deal with the betting brand back in 2017, said the decision was made after a review of the club's commercial strategy in line with their future growth plans. Now, Everton had already replaced the Sport Pesa logo in front of its jerseys during the league match versus Crystal Palace. That was on 8th February. The Goodison Park Club, which had two years left on the £9.6 million pounds a year agreement, will not have to pay a financial penalty. The move by the EPL side is not new, however. 2019 saw Tottenham controversially sabotage with one ex-bet catalyzed by the effects of gambling on society. In September 2019, Sport Pesa halted operations in Kenya after a rise in tax on betting stakes. And Chelsea will be seeking vengeance on Manchester United on Monday night at the Stamford Bridge after a 4-0 thrashing in the first leg. With Chelsea's Christian Pulisic and Ruben Loftus-Cheek ruled out due to injury, Blues top scorer Tammy Abraham will have a late fitness test to assess if he will feature. Now, fresh Red Devil... is hitting up in the latter stages of the circuit. Cabras maintained their lead atop the standings after round 14 with a clinical 37-26 win over playoff chasing hosts Impala. Meanwhile, defending champions KCB kept up the pressure on the leaders after seeing off Nakuru RFC 31-18 with a point separating Cabras from the bankers. Homeboys RFC cemented third place with a 37-14 win over Menengai, exiling the fifth place Oilers to uncertainty over a play off position. This as sixth place Mwamba kept their playoff hopes alive with a 50-32 win over Kisumu who together with Western Bulls are almost a shoo-in for relegation. And Real Madrid reclaimed their lead in the La Liga with a 2 all draw against Celta Vigo as Inter Milan's title ambitions took a hit after being stunned 2-1 by Lazio. This as Bayern Munich got back to winning ways cruising 4-1 past FC Cologne. Details of these and more in our European football wrap. Real Madrid moved a point above Barcelona in the La Liga. NTV Sport in association with Mozart Bet.
SMS NTV to 2990. Mozo Fund, lose one game, get your cash back. Make a decision. Terms and conditions apply. And it's just gone past 10 o'clock. That's all we have time for on NTV tonight. Thanks so much for your company. Do keep sharing your feedback, especially on Toxic Flow and any other stories, and we will indeed sample your views. And Flora Atiano has been our sign language interpreter. Thanks very much to her and from the rest of the team. We say good night, and Mark and I will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. This is N.